I think you're probably every Indian mother's dream. Uh, you're in TEDx <laughs> at 14 years old, uh, science, amazing student. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. No, thanks for having me. I don't know about the dream part, but yeah, come yeah. on. I'm gonna okay. I don't like to normally do this, right. read bios, but I'm going to, and this is the <laughs> one that I got. Okay, Angad Dariani, inventor and social entrepreneur with a background in electrical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. So here's where it gets interesting. Past work in fields of low cost, rapid prototyping, hands-on learning based education, digital signal processing, radar systems, low energy plasma, lithium ion energy storage systems, right. low cost health technologies, the internet of things, and filterless air purification, and there's more, but I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, who are you? Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. <laughs> is, that, is that how you describe yourself? If someone says, uh, hey, who, what do you do? Um, I think I just say I like to build things, whether it's uh, primarily almost always in the hardware space, but I like to build things that solve problems in the real world. Right on. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate you being here, and I want to chat a little bit about your time in the U.S. at mm -hmm. Georgia Tech, uh, and you also at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and mm -hmm. at MIT, mm -hmm. um, and talk a little bit about your experience there and, and how you decided to go to school in the States. But I thought an interesting place to start, and I watched a couple of your TEDx talks, mm -hmm. was you said you quit school in the ninth grade because it was killing your curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that and then how you ended up from that spot to school in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think growing up, I went to a you know typical public school in in Mumbai. And while I was performing well academically in school, uh, when I went to compete in international competitions like the Olympiads or, or others to pursue my interest in science, I realized there were significant fundamental knowledge gaps. Right. So now this is not me complaining about the education system, but for someone who's trying to pursue, say, advanced physics, having a strong mathematical foundation is very important, right? So if till ninth grade I am struggling to do LCM, right, Low, uh, least common multiple, right, that's a problem, right? Um, and so uh, that was very frustrating. And then, you know, f at the school that I went to was quite focused on rote education, right? So I think if you're really not understanding what you're spending 10 hours in school studying, um, right? I don't think there's a value add to be addressing a child's curiosity, right? Because if a kid learns something new and they understand it, they'll never forget it, right? Um, but if you're only forcing them to memorize it for a test, they will forget it three days down, mm. right? So that was the frustrating angle for me. I was very curious to learn new things in science, but felt I wasn't getting the... Uh, Getting my curiosity answered, so I dropped out of school. So you were hold on, you you yeah. were so in ninth grade. You're what, 13, 14 years old, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You were conscious, like self-aware enough at that point to be like, this rote memory style just isn't working for me. And B, you were able to convince your parents that this rote <laughs> memory style thing isn't working for me, and I want to go in a different direction. Right. So while I was in school, I was I just started building things a few years before dropping out, and I was following tutorials of many of these makers in the U.S. Right, Kip K, Make Magazine, mm -hmm. right, who are putting out open source tutorials on how to build things. Now we didn't have an Arduino in India, but I could find something else at the time. Uh, we didn't have the exact same like you know you have Altoids tin boxes they'd make projects out of. We didn't have Altoids, so I used Tic Tac, yeah, right, right, right here. Uh, but I was basically replicating projects and getting very excited to know that, hey, you know, for example, when electricity goes out, our phone lines are still active. You can draw power from phone lines and power your room in, in emergency cases. Really? Not, not the whole room, but like you can have lights and fans run, okay. <laughs> right? Um, so I think that was fascinating, and I used to build those things. So I was like, what am I learning in school versus what am I building at home after school? Huh. There seems to be a significant mismatch in in where I was personally, mentally. I think that was where the frustration, like what am I doing learning certain languages which uh, I don't speak in you know, most of the time. Yeah, but I think as students in, hi in high school especially, mm -hmm. we all kind of go through little phases like that where yes. what, am, you know, what am I learning about history for or whatever. Of course. But w uh, how do you make the step to, like, to drop out and take this alternative path, especially here in India? Right. Um, yeah, so, so just to like, uh, confirm, I don't, 
feel that there's no value of learning history or new languages or so. Just to clarify for everyone, I'm not dissing it. It's just when you're young and you don't have a comprehensive understanding of things, right? You're very in the moment. So being in the moment, I was like, this is not going to help me build X, Y, Z things. I always wanted to build a car when I was young, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, this is a waste of time. I'd rather learn a skill which will get me to building that car, right? Um, so, I, th I mean, my parents were confident that if I'm really complaining about something, and I wasn't someone who complained a lot growing up, right? And I was miserable in school for weeks on weeks. Mm -hmm. They're like, either something's not working out in school, like he's being bullied or something, or he genuinely does not like it, right? And fortunately, it was the latter. And then fortunately, um, my sister at the time was going to this math tutor, um, and we met him. He was also a U.S. educator. I think he went to Oberlin or, or okay. yeah, uh, I think at the time. Um, and he said, you know, when kids play, say, tennis for the country or state, they have to open school because they don't have time to go to school, yeah. right? So they take their tests privately. And that curriculum is open to all. You can register online and take. you can, you can pick when you want to give the test based on your availability. So he said, let's try that. When you're in ninth grade and you lose one year, worst case, nothing happens. Sure. Right? Uh, so I think it was several months of debate. And then my dad just said, you know, hey, we have nothing to lose uh, if we do it. And it's their courage, I think, uh, more than mine. Wow. Uh, so what, what shifted for you when you started, when you started homeschooling? Yeah, I think uh, very importantly, he was able to identify basic fundamental, like fundamental problems with my academic knowledge, right? So for example, I was in mid ninth grade, I was struggling to solve a lot of fifth grade mathematics problems, which mm. is concerning, right? How am I getting hundreds on math tests, which is, <laughs> right? Um, and so, uh, I th so I think he made me basically, there were a lot of these SAT tests, which are you know not as advanced mathematically, or not SAT, but there are some other, I think there's one level below SAT for younger kids, right? So he made me do all those tests. Um, and then there were other programs in like for IGCSE and others. So you just take different curriculums across India, make me do all the math problems under a topic from all the curriculums, right? So I did fractions from all the curriculums, right? Um, and so you're actually, you're working harder at home than you were in school. Yeah, and all my time was going into actually studying. Whereas when you're in a classroom, you're quite distracted. You're not really doing anything in a classroom, right? Um, and then you're going to tuitions after to learn things. So I'd spend six or eight hours at the tutor's place learning different subjects, and then I was free. So I'd go build my own things or go play soccer. <laughs> right on. So, ev so eventually then you decided to go to school in the US, to university. Right. Right. Uh, talk about that process a little bit and how you were thinking about your next steps at the time. Yeah, so uh, I, c I think as I mentioned, right, when I was younger, I was uh, watching all these people in, in uh, you know, building these cool things in the US, and I was like, people seem to be more have more creative freedom, right? Even in engineering, um, my dad went to Georgia Tech oh, uh, right for on. grad school, um, and I always heard stories of it. He was only there for I think two years or so, but I always heard stories growing up. He had this bee t uh, sweatshirt that he had kept for many years, right? Uh, the Honey Bee Georgia Tech's uh, mascot. Um, so um, yeah, I think that was since childhood I heard about it. And then I was fortunate to get to visit US when I was younger. F I went to Disneyland, um, right? And um, I think uh, it, it sort of got ingrained that, you know, uh, and also like when I was open schooling, I'd written this uh, angry email to a professor at MIT saying, you know, MIT gets kids from all around the world. Why not India? And the next day I got an opportunity <laughs> to work with MIT because I'd attached all my projects and, and stuff. So. <laughs> Okay. Uh, um, yes, yeah, Dr. Ramesh Raskar. Uh, he was very forthcoming, uh, and then they were actually fortunately visiting India at the at the time uh, with their team doing the MIT India Initiative. Uh, so I got involved, worked with them for about north of two years. Um, then I went. I was doing eleventh and twelfth grade in IB school, and then prepped to go to the U.S. Okay. Um, so then let's let's talk a little bit about. Well, let me ask. Let me go back for a second. During that time period, you're sort of ninth and twelfth grade. Like, what was the, what was the biggest challenge that you faced at that time? Like, what was an obstacle you had to overcome? Right. So, from interacting with uh, or being exposed to not so strong academic backgrounds to being on M being with MIT folks, you know, PhDs, postdocs. That's quite far apart, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, in being academic bandwidth. So while I felt like I was confident compared 
to the students I used to study with academically, when I'm interacting with MIT postdocs doing integrals in their mind, uh, you know, I suddenly don't even know what an integral is in ninth grade, right? So then I was, you know, there was the aspiration or learning that even with all the fancy brands, you still have to get your foundations in place. So I was able to build hardware, but if you really want to design your own circuits, design your own chips, there's a lot of background knowledge which must go into it, right? And that's what was the understanding that I need to go to undergrad and, and study fundamentals of electrical engineering um, because that's where my interest area yeah, was. Yeah, why did why'd you pick elect electrical engineering? I mean, you had this sort of inventorish background, maybe mechanical. I mean, what was, what was the, the impetus for that? So mechanical and electrical, in my opinion, are the two most general form of engineering. Um, I would do either or, but I had more interest towards things uh, which you could program and bring life to, right? So a uh, robot is a bunch of metal parts without a program running on it. Okay. <laughs> right? So, and, and without power. Um, you can power the world with solar energy. You can power on clean energy. Everyone needs electricity. You need electric vehicles. Your phone uses... Uh, electromagnetic waves to communicate to the class. It's all in the elect electrical engineering spectrum, right? So that's why EC. So eventually you make your way down to Georgia Tech, which mm -hmm. is in Atlanta, yes. which is the southern part of the United States, yes. which is maybe different than people's stereotype of the U.S. <laughs> right. So talk a little bit about moving to the south and, right. and what you noticed. I think um, my exposure to the United States was Manhattan. Uh, was some parts of Florida that to like Disneyland, right? Not not Florida, Florida. Um, and I interacted with a lot of folks in Boston and California, right? So when uh, going to South is, I think it's it's not. It, I felt like I was not in the United States for some time, but I think that was just the first couple of days because I didn't know too many people when when I went there. Um, but I soon realized they were uh, if you're really friendly with. They're really friendly people if you really get to know them, right? Um, and um, I discovered Chick-fil-A when I was <laughs> in the South. Uh, that was interesting because get got to eat that almost every day on, on campus. That was your go-to, was <laughs> Chick-fil-A. Because um, uh, very often I would have classes just around lunch, right? And Chick-fil-A was the quickest, uh, you know, food you can grab and run to class in like, you know, three, four minutes. So Chick-fil-A, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, a uh, chicken sandwiches. Right. Are the, are <laughs> right. The, they're um, and then uh, the other exciting, so Atlanta was actually an acquired taste for me. I am born and brought up in Mumbai. It's a very busy city, right? Atlanta at night feel, felt dead to me, cause, maybe because it's very widespread, okay. right? Compared to Manhattan where you know have, you have narrow roads and you can see the other side of, of the road, Atlanta is more spread out, um, right? And typically downtown, your expectation is that that's where the life will be. But in case of Atlanta, it was midtown and outskirts of Atlanta where, where the life was. So that's why I said it's an acquired taste. Initially, I thought, you know, it felt like a dead city, but as I got to meet more people and actually got to explore it, today I can't find a city like Atlanta, hmm. right? Because you have the comfort, you have the space. It's not as expensive as your San Francisco or Manhattan, but you have everything you'd want uh, in a, in or around the city. You ever think about doing your, now, now you have a startup now that's based in uh, California and mm -hmm. here in India. Mm -hmm. Any part of you wanted to start that in Atlanta? From a space-wise, definitely. Right, uh, Atlanta or Texas, right? But uh, from just from where the talent density is today for the stuff that we do, I think that's why we picked uh, the Bay Area okay. for running the company. Uh, yeah. Classic, why not? Uh, <laughs> but let, let's get back to the South for a second. Yeah. Um, did you at any time, so the South has an unfair and undeserved reputation for being not the most ra racially sensitive part of the, of the United right. States. Right, uh, It's just, that's the way it is. Um, did you ever experience what, what you felt was discrimination or anything like that? No, not in Georgia, never, never. Not, never during my time at Georgia Tech. I mean, it's one of the highest ranked schools in the world, sure. right? So we, there is a certain level of uh, depth one must have to either work there or study there, right? So I've not experienced it during my time in, in Atlanta or, or anywhere in Georgia. 
Um, there are, of course, you'll see it in India, you'll see it in Europe, right? There's always some element of discrimination, but I don't think that's a reflection on a city or a state. It may be a reflection on that person, right? So I've experienced some of it, you know, in, uh, in very uh, different, like, small parts of Florida, maybe, when I'm driving through, but I don't, like, it's nothing that concerns me. It's, it's more like that person's problem. I don't think it's a state issue either. Okay, fair yeah. enough. <laughs> Uh, and I do want to talk about the startup that you're working right. on now because it's very interesting with clean tech. And I want to talk about some of the stuff I read out earlier too, um, <laughs> including low energy plasma. Right. So I don't know what that is. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do want to talk about food because you met, you brought out Chick Fil A and right. you're in the South. Any other interesting Southern foods? Yeah, I didn't know you can have chicken and waffle together. That oh, was just yeah, very right. oh, very odd. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not I'm not the biggest fan, but yeah, that was interesting. Um, I think in Atlanta, w I think I got used to eating a lot of sushi, which I wouldn't eat in, in, in India before, so. Boy, I would never associate uh, Atlanta, Atlanta with sushi. sushi. Yeah. Um, but okay. Um, then I've had uh, Korean food, which we don't get. I, I mean, you get some dishes here, but yeah, I, there was a Korean place close to school um, I used to go to. Uh, tried Red Lobster for the first time when I was sure. in, in a Atlanta. franchise seafood place. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, did you have a roommate? Uh, different part, d during different times of school I did. And in fact, my f I transferred to Georgia Tech. I was at UMass Amherst before that. So I got in, like, admit very close to start date of school. Um, and my roommate was from Atlanta, but, you know, between LA and so I had this glam <laughs> uh, roommate who was working in film ah. at the time, yeah. Okay, so um, w w had you had a roommate be before this? Yeah, in, in at UMass, of course, I had uh, I was sharing a room, but in Atlanta, we were sharing an apartment. Oh, okay. I've never had to share a room in, at Georgia Tech. Yeah. Okay. Any weird, like, American idiosyncrasies living with an American guy? Versus? Yeah, of course. Um, I had a lot of, because Georgia Tech is a state school, there were a lot of, people from state of Georgia. I uh, have a lot of friends there today. Now they're uh, at Harvard or MIT doing grad school. But uh, yeah, I have a lot of friends from Georgia. Right on. Yeah. OK, cool. So you, gra you graduate from Georgia Tech with mm -hmm. your electrical engineering degree. Right. Uh, when do you decide you're going to do it? Uh, actually, you've probably wanted to do a startup since you were like two. Um, <laughs> but when do, you when do you decide to make the move to, to your current project? Um, I think I started working on it seriously and during second year of college. That's when I got into Georgia Tech. Um, the chain of thought was that, you know, our parents' generation grew up with the promise of an exciting future. My generation grew up with the promise of a bleak future. Do you think so, really? Yeah, because think of it this way, right? When my parents were younger, they were not thinking about the environment. They were thinking about building a career, enjoying life, and having a family. When I was brought up, I grew up with the news of animals going extinct, water is polluted, air is polluted, right? Trees are being cut down, <laughs> right? That's not an exciting future to wake up to. And I don't think at the time, every couple of days, you were reading an article about how the earth is doomed, right? So I feel like if you're working that hard in school or you're trying to build a career, and eventually the, the future is not that exciting, why are you doing what you're doing? Just go enjoy enjoy life, right? That's a very sort of nihilistic, yeah, okay, fine, um, okay. But my approach towards it has been quite contrary to the thought process, right? We said to solve climate, you not only have to build technology that's sustainable, but you have to build a product that's far superior than what exists today. It has to be far more affordable than what's available today, right? Tesla didn't build the best electric car. They built the best car, period, hmm. right? So you have to get people to love your product, and hey, by the way, this is good for the planet. Yeah, this is true, because there were electric vehicles, I can remember, right. from, I think Honda maybe did an electric vehicle back in the day, and it was and everyone just made fun of it, right? right? And that was the end of that car. Right. Um, so, okay, that's a fair point. So, but your, your, your current startup, uh, what's it called? It's called Pran, means stream of life in Hindi or Sanskrit. Okay, so you Pran, yeah. and yeah. you are doing basically Carbon recapture is that is that a fair? I, I'm probably underselling it. No, so I mean, not from a selling perspective. I think initially we started with the air pollution thought process, okay. um, and it's still probably like primarily quite focused on particulate matter um, because um, EVs and other systems already exist. Now it's a scaling challenge, right? So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But it's going to take 30 to 40 years till we see widespread adoption. Like a grid is not ready to charge these many cars, mm. right? 
uh, in that time, majority of countries around the world are going to continue to develop their infrastructure and, and, and manufacturing, especially after COVID, I think manufacturing is getting decentralized again which means you're going to have increase in particulate matter as a result increase in air pollution okay right air pollution is not solved by planting trees particulates are not a tree co2 is a tree prime <laughs> tree uh, trees are for co2 not for particulates um, i mean people say that moss and certain species remove particulates but fundamentally what's happening is they're blocking up the pores in the in the uh, in the plant species so that's not a it's not a solution so I said, you know, uh, COVID-19 as pandemic killed about three and a half million people. Air pollution kills seven million people every year. We don't take it nearly as seriously, right? And it, it has long-term effects on health, right? I think when you're in the United States, you're far more energetic than you are in Mumbai because of the air quality, right? So we said if that's the problem, then it becomes a probability game of who gets different lung cancers or other kind of serious diseases. Let's build something that will solve this problem. Well, and this is the thing too, right? Just like anything, um, <laughs> if you can afford it, mm. I can have air filter. I can have filters throughout my Correct. house. I, my car has a filter in it. My if I my office can have a filter in it, right? And so at the end of the day, it's sort of like the common folk or, or the lower end of the spectrum who end up getting hurt the most by Correct. this stuff. Like anything, with, with water, air, like all of it, right? Because right. if you got money, you can basically solve all of that. But you, uh, you're doing filters though, but no, sorry, you're not doing filters. Some kind of filterless filter? What, what, yeah. what, help <laughs> yeah. me understand this. Yeah, so um, there's two challenges with filter. You mentioned the more important one, which is cost and accessibility. The second one is that when you dispose them, they end up in landfills. So that air pollution gets now converted to water, soil, or goes back into the air from the land. So you're not solving any problem fundamentally, right? Um, I don't think there's a technology issue with filters. So I'm not dissing the companies who do it, right? It's fine for your room or whatever. But from an accessibility standpoint, a government type of school, right, which is low income, kids are barely getting the money to get to school. Many are walking several hours to go to school, right? they can't afford filter replacement every day. So to build scalable technology, one, you had to build technology that had near zero maintenance and cost. That's where we came in. Second, we said this has to solve the problem at scale. I can't put a filter in every room. So where there are many schools where there's only one large auditorium where everyone studies. There are common areas where kids play, right, where you can't, you can't have these tiny air purifiers. So what Pran does is we deploy a cluster of devices, right? These are about six feet tall, filterless, weatherproof, filled with sensors, and, and you know, it's designed it's to be a big, outdoor. Big bot, big it's big about six feet, okay. right? Um, it's taller than I am. But um, and then, uh, th the number of devices that we deploy on a property is tailored to the pollution dynamics on that property. So like if I take two adjacent housing complexes in New Delhi, right? the airflow dynamics on those properties will be unique because the architecture is different, exposure level is different. And you have a way of figuring that out? Yeah, we use software to do that, right? Oh, that's <laughs> uh, cool, okay. So what Pran will do is we'll come install sensors for a couple of days. That data is fed into the software. In parallel, we've created a 3D model of the space. We basically replicate the physical environment in software, solve it in software, and then ship the hardware. And you can <laughs> then, like, in a, in a boutique level, say, put this device here, put this device exactly here, because right. you're able to predict the airflow characteristics and the pollution. Right. Jeez. Okay. Um, I'm not saying I'm filtering the atmosphere. That's like unrealistic. What we're saying is we're creating hyper local clean air zones. Yeah, and, right? and you're, that's what you're putting it. If, if 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 the air is dirtiest here, put the thing here, right? Um, and because every instant, if a, if the filter is somewhere close by, both of us will be breathing the cleaner air. Yeah. Even though it is pulling in the polluted air due to uh, convection, right? We are instantaneously breathing cleaner air. But if there's no filter, how does it get the bad stuff out of the air? <laughs> That's where the low plasma stuff comes Oh, in, hey, right? I didn't, that was not so <laughs> low, up. I had no low, idea. Low energy plasma stuff. So basically charging the particles, uh, separating them from the air, and collecting them without any charged plates, right? So typically in industry, you have something called an electrostatic precipitator. Right? I know. So, so like cement or coal plants have this building size device, okay. which is charging the pollution. And then you have these 
plates which have the opposite charged. Okay. So if you have positively charged pollution coming, it's sticking to negatively charged plates, and okay, the rest so of the like a, ma like a magnet, and so we the the device can take the particulate in the air, give it an electric charge. Right that's positive or negative? In our case, we don't have the opposite charged plates. We are charging them both positive. It would be complicated. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it would be. So think of it as charging. To, if you have only two pollutant particles, I charge one with positive, one with negative. As they're flowing, they're attracted to each other. So one part, one medium sized, two medium sized particles have become one large sized particle. And now these two large sized particles which exist have opposite charge. They stick together. So they're getting heavier and heavier. And we've designed the airflow in a way where it's getting collected in a collection chamber. OK. <coughs> right. So you're using, let's break it, make it super simple. You're using electric charges to basically suck the, the pollutants out of the atmosphere. Right. But then you've got a big collection know, box of, of, of pollutants, right? right? right. What, ha what happens to that stuff? So we work with a company in uh, Hubli in India. Um, they make flooring tiles out of air pollution. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> right? How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, uh, think of it as just a support structure material. So they use the same marble chips, cement, et cetera, that goes in to make tiles. But you store this away for decades, right? How frequently do you change your flooring tiles? <laughs> right? Yeah, so the pollutants go into the tiles. So right. you've got something that you can kind of sell, right. right? You've got a, a marketable product that's right. basically pollution. And I would imagine that if I could market the tile as like, I mean, it's kind of whatever, green, cool, right? Like it is ESG compliant tiles, right? Yeah, and like I've got, I, these, yeah, it's kind of a cool, uh, you know, thing, right? These are my, my air pollution tiles. And they really look good because the person who runs that company is an architect. So in fact, there are several Adidas stores in New Delhi which use these flooring tiles, hmm. right? Um, and uh, I was talking to you before this about using CO2 to cure the tiles, right? So typically, the curing process is you know 20 to 40 days for these tiles. But if you put it in a confined uh, pressurized chamber with CO2, you can cure it in a couple of hours. And, and, and the right. CO2 gets trapped then in, in, in the, the tile. tile. So it's stored away. And that becomes a carbon negative tile, where you've stored in 5 well, kgs of CO2 into the tile from the atmosphere. So it's carbon negative tile, and it has Air pollution <laughs> material in it, Correct. and you can put it in your house, and, and it looks really good. Man, right? killer! That's <laughs> great. Um, uh, look, you, you're you are a smart guy. You know a lot more about this stuff than I do. But there's one thing I do want to ask you about because you've talked about EVs, electrical vehicles, quite a bit. Right. What's your take on this sort of view that okay, they're better for air pollution, obviously, than right. um, than combustion right. engines, but. There's the cost of digging up rare, you know, rare earths. Right. There's the cost. Of how where's the is the electricity coming from a coal powered plant? Then, mm -hmm. like, wh I'd like to learn your perspective on like that piece of it because it's not sort of as simple as this right. is good, this is bad. So I have, uh, by the way, many people think that because I work in pollution capture, I'm a proponent of fossil fuels. Please, there's nothing uh, f further away from reality. I've worked on EVs. I've worked on lithium energy, you know, battery storage for the grid level. Um, so th think of it this way, right? If by running all the vehicles on, say, if you have 1,000 vehicles and you're, it's being powered from one coal power plant, right? You've isolated the pollution source. Oh, okay. Right? And then you convert it to solar, right? So that is a more solvable, like scalable approach to solving the problem. As opposed to rare earth materials for lithium ion, aluminum ion, sodium ion, or others, right? Um, I think there are ways to increase battery lifespan. I think there are m different materials. Like one of our investors is the founder of a company called Log9 Materials. They make aluminum ion batteries, not lithium ion. And oh, they're making what electric. Is an what is an aluminum ion battery? Different kind of substrate for your electrodes and, and huh. uh, right? Why have, not, why have I not heard of this? Is it like less efficient than lithium ion? It's or? new, and they've just started selling it to three-wheeler companies, right? Huh. So three-wheeler tempos in India, there's a company called Omega Seki in, uh, in New Delhi. They use aluminum ion batteries huh. to, uh, to, to run electric vehicles. Um, the, uh, the positive side is not just carbon. It's reduced nitrous oxide, sulfur oxides directly in the atmosphere that you're breathing, which comes from the tailpipes of your cars. Long term, EV is a win-win. Clean energy is a win-win. There's going to be a peak where we are maximizing our EV production, and we are to support that, we are maximizing our fossil fuel consumption. Right? 
Uh, because you have to at, at power plants. Yeah, at power plants, you'll set up factories, and that's your energy needs oh, are right. growing. Okay. Right? But it's going to be a tipping point, and then we'll come to a saturation point, which is lower, where you can power everything on renewable energy. Okay, <laughs> but it's a step by step process. Let's get the EVs on the road. So, your, your view is sort of get the electrical vehicles on the road first. Yeah, we're like, it was due yesterday. Right, right <laughs> like, but, 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 but it's not the sort of, because right now it seems to me there's sort of a movement for let's do everything in parallel. Right. right. Let's do EVs and let's do renewable and let's figure out, you know, new materials to use. But it, from what you're suggesting, it sounds like maybe better to just focus exclusively or m the majority on getting electrical vehicles on the road. Check that box. Now the pollution is, is um, consolidated mm -hmm. to power plants and solve the renewable issue. Is that my... No, I strongly feel everything must happen in parallel because what do you do when the battery run, like is you're at end of life of battery? So you need to have companies like Redwood Materials who recycle those batteries, send back the rare materials so you can make batteries again, right? Um, you need to set up multiple EV companies. Everyone thinks, you know, if you start a company or competition to someone else. How many car companies exist today outside of EV, right? They're not, oh. uh, right, when you, that's just market, you get an option of which car to buy. Doesn't mean you're going to not buy an EV in the future, right? Um, your grid should in parallel move to renewable energy to make sure that, you know, if you have 1,000 coal power plants, I'm already converting many of them to solar energy or wind or tidal, right? Uh, everything has to happen in parallel, has to happen far more aggressively than it happens today. Right. Do you have a favorite renewable energy source? Like, are you a solar guy? I'm a solar, solar guy. You're a solar guy. Yeah. Okay. Why? Yeah. Just out of, what, what is it about solar? Um, I think uh, while this, I think the downside is the space and the timing. Okay. Uh, like you know, you can only ideally do it for eight to ten hours in a day, right? Um, but uh, the upside is that with nuclear geothermal, there's always some kind of waste and heat which is generated and which must be disposed of, right? So I'm not, s if I have to compare coal and nuclear, I'll pick nuclear in a heartbeat, right? But if if you have to pick nuclear versus solar, I think that's an easy <laughs> con. What about wind yeah. or hydro? Wind, I just don't like how they look. That's one, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll pick it up. And secondly, like with the wind, I think there's problems with uh, noise. There's problems with birds running birds, into I the know. windmills. Um, maintenance is very expensive of mm. windmills, right? Um, so it's just very expensive to do what solar can do. Okay, so you're yeah. a solar guy. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, look, Angad Dariani, uh, I yes. appreciate you being here today. Well, we can leave things there. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting story. If people want to learn more about this tech that you're working on now, have you got a website or yeah. what, what is it? It's pran.io, P R A A N.io. Okay, pran.io to yeah. check out more about this cool, clean tech. Uh, good luck to you and thanks for coming no, on. Thanks for having me.